Good evening and welcome for what is the second in our joint RBA Wessex and RBA Southwest People, Place and Planet series for 2021, with tonight's event kindly being sponsored by Ibstock and the RBA Local Initiative Fund. Before we begin, a note to say this session will be recorded and published on architecture.com and on the RBA YouTube channel. Please keep your microphones and videos off, although I don't believe you've got that function in this version of MS Teams. And the Q&A tab is open, so please do send your questions throughout the presentations, which we'll put to the, the panel at the end of their presentations. We also ask that you put your name and practice, so if not all questions are asked during the session, we will respond to you post-event. So my name is Tom Bell. I'm an architect based in Gloucestershire and the RBA Wessex Regional Chair. This event is part of a continuation of our People, Place and Planet series from 2020, which was originally intended to end in a crescendo of activity leading towards COP26. So we've just rolled it over another year. The urgency is still there, however. So last year with Teams and Zoom, a phrase that became synonymous with 2020 was you are on mute. But the year was quite the opposite with our voices being globally connected and heard virtually for the first time. This saw a year of activism, campaigning, challenging inequality in architecture and society, but also a year of knowledge sharing, upskilling and optimism for the future. So if 2020 was a year of talk and connectivity, 2021 is going to be a year of action with a regional focus on data outputs, creating a body of knowledge and harnessing the power of our newfound virtual networks to use these to support and influence our conversations with the local authorities, governments and to seek policy changes to respond to the climate, biodiversity and ecological emergency. So our first guest speaker this evening is going to set the scene and I'm delighted to welcome uh, Samita Singer, who is uh, the Design Practice Ecologic, has carried out a diverse portfolio of projects in the UK and abroad. She has taught architecture and technical design for 20 years and was also one of the creators of Architects for Change, the Equality Forum at the RB, and has been the past Chair of Women in Architecture. At present, she sits on the RBA Professional Standards Committee and its Ethic and Sustainable Development Commission. So by means of virtual round of applause, I'd like to welcome Samita Singer. Uh, well, thank you everyone who's joined in. So if we go to the second slide, please. So I qualified with a Masters in Sustainable Design more than 30 years ago, when no one knew what I'd been studying. It was very mysterious. So I work across many sectors such as design, health, charity and education, working on a common base of sustainable design and a people centred approach to design. While knowledge of climate change has existed since 1970s, Google Trends show that since 2006 climate crisis searches have increased. I wrote my first book more than 10 years ago the architecture for rapid change and scarce resources to include a holistic view of development and climate change. Now it has been adopted for design professionals in the US. In my second book, Autotelic Architect, I tried to show the duties of the architect should include consideration what, for what was merely a change in the 1970s and that has turned into a full blown crisis through ignorance, interference, greed and apathy. According to experts, the climate crisis will be the equivalent of a COVID crisis every year, starting from the middle of the century and not just a one-off event. And the COVID crisis is a result of mankind's interference in nature and the environment. My last book, which was actually published just at the beginning of 2020, looked into better health care that works with nature, not against it. So that's the last one book you see. So on the third slide, we go on to look at climate justice. Now, no one can self isolate from climate crisis, as this large map shows you. It will be the people that haven't contributed to the crisis that will be the most affected. So if you look at the map on the top right, you will see where the most carbon emissions are being produced. And these are all the rich nations but everyone's going to suffer, particularly, of course, the uninhabited regions of Antarctic and the Arctic. The poor who live in the most appalling conditions are separated by urban constructions will suffer the most despite contributing the least to the crisis. So 
if we go on to the next slide, we'll see why that is happening. So there are certain you know, biases due to which we've got here. And that's because mankind collectively suffers from these biases. So let, let's look at these three basic levels, personal, societal and environmental. At the personal level, we have a short term vision, perhaps extending to three generations after us. We don't really actually think about what's going to happen after that. Despite the Internet and social media, we see what we want to see. So we have these algorithms which filter out things we don't like seeing and puts out what we like to see. And thirdly, most importantly, we are hardwired to waste. I have seen mountains of oyster shells in a deserted beach in Mexico left there by hundreds of people, uh, hundreds of years before. Small hills of waste of uh, glass bottles in a Cornwall left behind by Victorians. And nowadays people throwing things out of their cars. The only difference is what we now throw away is not biodegradable or useful. At the societal level, we believe that somehow institutions, economy and technology will save us. We also believe in the linearity of progress that will continue to improve our society as we go along. We can't go back, but actually COVID has shown us that we can go back. In fact, we have gone back to 1990. Um, it's also nature is not uh, nature is cyclical, not linear. So, you know, we are designing systems that continue to be linear. Um, and so at the past at the environmental level, uh, level, we believe that nature is benevolent. Truly, it is a neutral thing and holds the ultimate power. We can use nature, we can work with nature, but nature can also destroy us as we've just seen. So in the next slide, we see the disconnection that's happening. Why? So the disconnection is happening because of these biases. We find it easier to disconnect from where stuff comes from and ignore the cyclical nature. That is why concepts such as circular or donut economy are very hard to put into practice, although they've been there for a long time. The truth is that we have but one planet that definitely supports life. We know that and we can't even look after it. And we're trying to go to Mars to see if we can live on it. We're even polluting space surrounding our beautiful planet with more than 1,062,000 objects circling it at the moment as we speak. So in the next slide, what we'll see is the resources that's um, primary cause of all this. So carbon emissions are considered under two broad headings. One is the operational carbon, which is the carbon dioxide emitted when the building is being used, and embodied carbon, carbon dioxide embedded in the buildings used in, in the building, in the construction. So whole life carbon includes both these aspects and includes materials, transport, construction, maintenance, disposable plus operational energy, and which comes to around 66%. And with um, best practice, we can actually reduce the operational energy um, to halve it or be, be even less. So I'll be looking at more at embodied carbon at this presentation. One reason is the architects love the materiality. Vitruvius is three principles of design, durability, beauty and utility are about materials basically. Steen Ella Rasmussen's seminal book, Experiencing Architecture is About Materiality. Charles Moore, Carlos Garpa, Islamic architecture, Hindu temples, churches, you name it. Architecture seems to be about experiencing materials. Architects connect with and use materials. While operational carbon has become more and more efficient, embodied carbon is a more of a wicked problem. Embodied carbon benchmarking is not considered in many building typologies and, and whole life carbon cycle. Typically, life of a new building is about 60 years old, which is very poor compared to pre-modern buildings such as the Victorian terraced house. The most problematic is how material is being sourced. So at the moment, concrete is the most used material in the world. But what makes concrete? A large amount of sand, which is a non-renewable resource, 
Sand is also used to make glass, another modern building material. So what you see in this slide is how beautiful clean sand has been looted from my village in India along the entire riverbed of this river and exported abroad. It's very expensive. It's one of the most uh, looted resources in the world going on illegally. The whole ecology of the place has changed. You can see the villages have been left with this broken bamboo bridge. So the global consumption of resources will treble and the construction sector is the larger consumer of materials in the UK. The whole, um, just like climate injustice, again, the poor will pay for this ecological destruction that we are uh, wrecking on the planet. There is, of course, the environmental product declaration, but that is based on carbon emissions, not ethics. Therefore, in a way, you can have timber from a rainforest, which could have low um, uh, environmental product declaration. Um, so at the moment, there is no way of checking the ethical provenance of material. So going on to the next slide. RAP, which is um, the Waste Recycling Agency, has declared, declared that all public sector buildings need to have recycled content of just 10%. Now, that's very easy to do, but still recycling is an expensive and um, problem um, and it's also carbon, it's, it's not carbon free. So how do we get from 10 to 100 or even 95 percent? So which buildings are almost 100 percent carbon free in their embodied energy? I started looking at this and of course vernacular construction is of that nature, but our lifestyle and tastes have changed and we don't want to use buildings like this uh, church in Norway anymore. Uh, this is like actually a museum at the moment. As our tastes have changed, the diversity of building materials have also changed and there become very few materials. We like to use brick, concrete, cement, glass um, and some timber. So the palette of materials has also become smaller. Buildings all over the world look the same. Uh, but just going from that um, uh, model of that um, timber church, here you can see in Norway the world's greenest um, airport, which has uh, got a lot of timber in it. Uh, it's at Oslo. And also this is a multi-use, multi-storey buildings, 84 metres high, also in Norway. So it is possible to use timber in a way uh, for our modern lifestyles. So going to the next slide, um, here's my provocation to you, which I'll leave you with. So start with reducing what you want. Remember that 75% of all buildings needed in Western Europe have already been built by last year. So what can we do? We can retrofit existing buildings. We can design better and design quality using less materials. We can design for reuse recovery um, so that parts can be reused very well. So they've started a uh, project in Sweden at the moment like that. Resource locally to make sure that the embodied energy is low. Then prefer to rethink materials. What is what are the materials we are using? Think carefully about that. Can we use materials that we haven't used before, which are more eco friendly? Keep it simple design for reuse, avoid reinventing the wheel and then finally just avoid doing this altogether if you can. I mean recycling is an option but it's an expensive option. Sending things to the landfill also takes up energy and it's producing methane and all sorts of uh, pollute pollution. Uh, try to design, uh, try to keep building materials to um, you know the, the what you, just to what you need and not excessive and try, you know, about recycling is always it downcycles the material rather than upcycles it. So concrete people say, oh, it can be recycled or reused, but that's all actually downcycling it. So I will leave you now with these um, provocations to get from 10% to 95% at least, or 100%, and hope to have a discussion with you later on. Thank you. Thank you, Smita. I think it's quite apt that you talk about uh, kind of retro first. It was one of the AJ's main campaigns is now getting some 
uh, kind of policy reform is getting some traction with MPs. Um, but I'm sure there'll be lots of questions about that after our presentation. So on to our next guest speaker, uh, we're delighted to have Judith Kimpin, who is an architect and environmental policy expert based in London. After 20 years in practice, she currently teaches low energy architecture and planning at UCL and chairs the Architects Council of Europe's Sustainable Architecture Group, focusing on embedding feedback in design and construction to deliver a net zero built environment. She's also the co-author for the Energy People Buildings Making Sustainable Architecture Work, um, which I know many of you have picked up through our Instagram campaign for this event. So again, by means of virtual applause, uh, please welcome Judith. Hello, and thank you very much. Uh, I think I should try and share my screen if that's... Samita, thank you so much for the lovely introduction. It's it's really great to, to hear you talk about these topics um, with, with so much insight and inspiration. Um, and I have to say, I'm so pleased to be able to share some thoughts today with all of you about the topic of climate literacy. Um, it's really, it is in the context, as Tom said, in, in of, of our forthcoming book, Energy People Buildings, Making Sustainable Architecture Work. And um, it's been long in the coming, in the making, and, uh, and we are thrilled to be able to share glimpses of it today. Um, so what is climate literacy and, and, and why do we need it? Um, this is just a very quick snapshot of a cross-industry climate framework. Um, the the cross-industry action group has created a, this initiative, which is in broad alignment with the UN Sustainable Development Goals and is closely related to the RIBA Climate Literacy Knowledge Schedule, which is being developed and will be out, I think, later on this year. Um, but I, I think what's really important for us architects is how can we make all this relevant to the day-to-day -day practice of architecture? So I wanted to start by revisiting some of the drivers, and I'm sure most of you have seen one or, or many different versions of, this, of these pie charts. But I think the, the point of that is, of these is that the built environment sector really does have a, a massive impact, and we as architects have the power to, um, to change that. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later on how, but it's worth looking at some top-down initiatives, um, wider continental initiatives. So the, uh, the EU's uh, 2050 zero carbon policies, the national um, legally binding um, net zero targets, zero carbon targets by 2050 for most, um, EU member states and also for the UK, um, and also uh, at the local level. So many local authorities have declared a climate emergency and are following up actively. Um, but notice that most of these commitments relate to zero carbon. And also bear in mind that we are really not in the same place as we were even a year ago uh, or two years ago. The realisation that we need leaps and not piecemeal action has really spurred some amazing activism and engagement and architects are really recognizing their huge influence and have led, led many leading initiatives some of which have become influential cross-industry movements and I, I think I've seen Sunita um, highlight some of these organizations. The COVID-19 pandemic has given a massive adrenaline injection to the climate movement strangely strengthening calls for a greater emphasis on green public realm and highlighting the need to transform city centres into healthier, greener neighbourhoods. And green urban grids are seen as arteries for safer, healthier transport and urban renewal. And of course, remote working has brought into sh very sharp focus the inequality of the spatial and architectural quality of homes and the impact of that on health and well-being. COVID has also exposed the fragility of certain building types and the resilience of others. For example, buildings that have stood the test of these difficult times have been those that offered operable facades, greater adaptability between home, office, retail functions. Um, some of, often these would have taller floor to ceiling heights, narrower floor plates and greater mass. 
taking on the prevailing investment models that predominantly favor a shorter lifespan typology. And lifespan is really a critical uh, terminology here that we often that often goes unsaid and unreported. So it's such an important multiplier um, in the embodied carbon um, figure. So change the lifespan or in other words, change the durability of materials, the usefulness, the serviceability, the adaptability of buildings, and it will actually have a massive impact on embodied carbon outcomes too. In fact, as we are increasingly accounting for these long-term aspects of performance, we no longer count energy only to support the more holistic decision-making. We are taking into account the environmental impact of all natural resources used, energy, water, material impact, as well as what we achieve with them, at least in terms of comfort and well-being, climate change resilience and, and capital and whole life costs. And we are beginning to start reporting more on, on value aspects too. Now, the earlier uh, images, and the, the earlier indicator, the earlier impact uh, are much more easily quantifiable than some of these latter ones. And but what we also want to do is not just um, account for them during design, but we want to avoid pushing impacts further along a building's life. We want to make sure that we account for these over the building's entire lifespan from product to construction to use, end of life and beyond life. So this may look like more accounting and do we need more accounting, but understanding how to make these impacts and benefits more tangible um, I think will help us balance conflicting drivers throughout design. For example, lower floor to floor heights help reducing heating loads due to a more compact form. They also reduce embodied carbon, but they increase overheating risk and lower ceilings and that are detrimental to the perception of available space. So there is a multitude of such considerations that designers face day in, day out, and making them more explicit means that the pros and, con the pros and cons can be more meaningfully evaluated for each project. Um, we discuss how this can be done in more detail in the Energy People Buildings book. For example, let's take existing buildings. Taking them down is often the preferred option um, in many cases, um, um, except in, uh, for historic buildings, of course, that are under protection. But instead, when we begin to look at the holistic metrics, the life cycle extension of existing buildings makes sense in almost all cases, and Samita touched on this earlier. While not all existing buildings are classified as historic, many have high embodied value. Their mass and spatial dimensions are exorbitant to replicate with new construction techniques. So is the richness of fractal surfaces and textures created by the materials and construction details as here captured by my very talented friend Andy Siddle. Um, whether existing or new, the importance of high quality architecture and public realm has been championed by the German Baukultur Foundation. I'm not sure how many of you have heard about this movement, but its influence has grown so much that Ursula von der Leyen has put the new European Bauhaus at the heart of the EU Green Deal and the Green Recovery Fund, each year totaling over a trillion uh, euros each. So, and nearly two trillion in the case of the Green Recovery Fund. So, it's it's very interesting to see how uh, different uh, political bodies are seeing architecture as a vehicle for transformation. Um, so, it's definitely worth keeping an eye on that one. Um, so, the existing store uh, stock is the source of the majority of environmental impact and 80% of the 2050 building stock is already in place. Renova renovation cycles happen on average every 15 to 20 years, but often take longer, which means that current retrofit retrofits can already lock in performance in 2050. We also need to massively accelerate the retrofit rate, but let's talk about that another time. <laughs> In terms of legislation, the UK government's future home standard, which will be rolled out in 2025, will actually leave the existing stock largely unaffected. 
Now, to stay with metrics and legislation, it's important to understand whether existing legislative effects have worked. For example, have building regulations reduced emissions in the building sector so far? Well, the Committee of Climate Change 2019 report shows that CO2 reductions from buildings are in fact minimal and actually largely due to the decarbonization of the grid um, and um, also taking manufacturing out, out, out of the United Kingdom, so outsourcing manufacturing. So what would we need to change to make a real dent in emissions? So one of the things that we are proposing is step one, start measuring real life performance and not just in the lab performance. Terms like efficacy versus effectiveness, emission standards versus as driven emissions can hide very important differences in assumptions as my electric car battery charge will testify. But this is exactly what we have in, in buildings too. So we have theoretical performance uh, versus actual performance. And the theoretical performance is an asset rating. And this is what we are predominantly regulating uh, during design stages. And there is no requirement to validate these uh, certificates. Now, as the graph uh, generated from the Innovate UK BPE report shows, there is actually no discernible relationship between an energy performance certificate and a display energy certificate rating or an operational rating for the same building. <clears throat> that means that the figure that we use during design stages and uh, hand over the building with will actually have little bearing on real performance outcomes. Um, and if you thought that EPCs in housing are more representative of outcomes, I would have to disappoint you. The UK BPE programme showed that projects with high ambition for energy performance um, and that were also considered low carbon at the time were underperforming by a very large margin, even though these houses were emitting less CO2 than the average UK dwellings. Dwelling, the figures were still more than two and a half times higher than the average design estimate. And the link between building regulations and actual emissions calculations is at best tenuous. So as I said earlier, a building's energy efficiency potential or its asset rating is not the same as its operational rating, which is based on measured or as driven performance. As this diagram shows, measured energy use includes all appliances as built fabric performance the use of technical systems as commissioned and as installed, um, as well as actual operating conditions. Although this difference is well known, in the absence of a better standard, the vast majority of projects are designing for compliance only. And as we have seen, compliance needs to be more demanding, especially in the area where we need the biggest impact retrofit. And if we are to improve the actual performance of buildings, we need to start counting what matters and understand how to plan for those currently unregulated energy uses that can amount to more than two thirds of a building's energy consumption in use. To address exactly this, the RIBA Sustainable Futures Group um, and also spurred on by the Ethics and Sustainable Development Com Com Commission have developed helpful benchmarks to guide architects about what operational metrics they should be aiming for by 2030. This change that we're seeing now, that is uh, professional bodies like the RMBA and SIFSI are beginning to target achieved performance in use, and it's a very big deal. In fact, the RIBA is also changing its awards criteria to reflect this change. The benchmarks in the RIBA 2030 challenge provide a helpful trajectory towards net zero for operational energy use but also for embodied carbon, water use and indoor environmental quality. This is a huge achievement for the RIBA Sustainable Futures Group and for everyone involved, including Gary Clark, who's been driving this forward. Gary, if you're there, thank you. <laughs> so how can we implement this approach for projects? Working with UCL, we came up with what we now call the Building Performance Register tested on live projects, the Building Performance Register sets out a way to track key performance metrics, along with a description of the way in which these are intended to be achieved. So the design approach, that means the BPR holds this information together 
all the way from design to operation as a form of sustainable design passport. The BPR can also help identify additional scopes of work, be embedded into the employer's requirements to help define aspects of a building sustainable architecture and form the basis of a performance contract, effectively making sure that the uh, sustainable measures and design measures and features of the building don't get value engineered separately in different silos and then end up not working together once the building is handed over. What happens in practice is that if the project team knows that feedback will happen, it actually aligns interests and clarifies responsibilities. It means that understanding people's behavior is an essential part of the design process. It becomes easier to integrate designs because it's in everyone's interest that systems work well and support occupancy patterns and needs. How many of you have had um, the commissioning of m systems resulting in tricky long-term adjustments to a building's systems? Commissioning and monitoring performance becomes less of a risk and more of a mitigation risk. And the user friendliness of all equipment and human build building interfaces really begin to matter. Finally, the building performance register together with feedback become core features of a performance contract. And what we have seen is that projects that target uh, operational performance in use contractually have a much higher likelihood of achieving that performance. That shouldn't really be a surprise, I guess. <laughs> Perhaps there is now a case for changing the age-old green design hierarchy diagram with one that takes into account human factors at the very start of the design process. This could take the form of a pre-project user experience consultation, which would be followed up by a user experience design process, a profound understanding of how occupants will be using a building, together with first-hand experience of how things can go wrong, is one way to remove risk from the process gathering feedback from occupants on how the design met their needs and expectations could be seen as risky to start with, but it is actually offering deep insight and it's this deep insight gained from feedback that adds so much rigor to research that we so need to accelerate innovation in this area. So these are some of the case studies we are featuring in the Energy People Buildings book. And I think what seems to be unique about these projects is that they all incorporate feedback gathered by the architects from buildings in use. And that performance was designed in from the start. The majority of these buildings had explicit contractual in-use performance targets um, for environmental performance, and all of them were monitored after completion. Energy People Buildings, the book, will give you a more in-depth insight into how this influenced the architecture and the outcomes, what worked well and what lessons we learned as a result of this process. The most exasperating thing in preparing this book was actually how difficult it was to find case studies with performance data and architectural merit. Sometimes it seemed as if the two approaches lived in separate realms. Building would either be able to use minimal energy or be beautifully designed but maybe it doesn't have to be so. It seems when it comes to climate literacy, in terms of the policy discussions, the elephant in the room, especially for us architects, is architecture. A building spatial and material configuration has a huge impact on performance and high quality architecture really adds so much more value to a building than performative measures can on their own. But it's still very hard to argue for architectural measures to be retained in the face of value engineering, even if they extend the lifespan, adaptability and usability of a building. Meanwhile, to the wider sector, it's architectural education that's the elephant in the room. And climate literacy certainly helps architects engage and design. Perhaps, and this is the book's premise, the actual elephant in the room may be feedback that is so precious for both architectural and environmental design inspiration. In the book, we discussed that feedback has taught, what feedback has taught us about what is working well or less well, about the way in which we design um, and regulate buildings. Many of the examples are based on the UK's Building Performance Evaluation Programme to date, um, 
one of the most comprehensive efforts to map the difference between expectations and outcomes. And the UK has really built an amazing expertise and body of expertise in this area, and we should make the most of it, really. Um, Hattie Hartman, who led the research on these case studies, and I hope you'll get a chance to hear her discuss her insights in the near future another time. The final chapter, Contract for Performance, outlines innovative approaches to incorporating feedback into project procurement. To meet 2030 climate targets, every aspect of a building's design must be scrutinized and challenged by every member of the project team, otherwise we just won't make it. This requires, really requires climate literacy, as well as a rudimentary understanding of subjects tackled in the different chapters of this book. Comfort, passive design, fabric performance, appropriate technical systems and user-friendly building controls. Um, we're very pleased with the book. Hope it will shine a light on the power of design to transform the sector. We hope one takeaway will be that climate literacy is not rocket science, but feedback from completed projects is a rocket fuel for innovation. As my favorite uncle used to say, there's less to it than you would think, my dear, but a bit more than you would hope. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. That was excellent. We look forward to the book, which is coming out on the 1st of March, uh, and everybody on this call will have a £5 off voucher uh, sent to them um, after the event as well, along with a £5 off venture that Samuta is co-contributed to, which is Rethink Design Guide as well. So our final guest speaker uh, before our Q&As, um, is Sophie Pelsmaker. Just a note on the Q&As, if you can please keep the questions coming in uh, and don't forget to add your name and practice as well. So Sophie Pelsmaker is an environmental architect, educator and researcher in sustainable housing design and architecture at Tampere University, Finland. She is author of the Environmental Design Pocketbook and guest edits at Everything Needs to Change, Architecture and the Climate Emergency. So Sophie, the, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, can you hear me okay and see the slides? Perfect, thank you. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for having me here today. And um, I'm really going to whisk through 10 key actions related to climate literacy, and I think it will reinforce several of the points that were made um, by my colleagues uh, just before me. Uh, so briefly about me, I dedicated the past 20 years to sustainable architecture. And I was born in Belgium, I lived in the UK for 20 years and I bring experience from Denmark and I'm now based in Finland where overnight it was minus 27 degrees because it's warming up a little bit to about minus 15. Uh, but it's beautiful uh, winter wonderland out here. And um, I'm at the moment co-authoring a climate emergency curriculum for bachelor students, which will be out next year. As you could hear from Judith as well, our Energy People Buildings Making Sustainable Architecture Workbook uh, is out now. I'm also working on the third edition of the, on the pocket book, and we will have, I think it's later next month or early April, our Everything Needs to Change uh, edited, guest edited issue with Nick Newman out as well. Um, very briefly, a recap. Um, since 2019, we've had headline after headline about the climate crisis. And we've been told by the UN that we've got 12 years to limit climate change catastrophe, but actually this is now only 10 years left. Um, we've also just last month been told that 2020 was the joint hottest year ever recorded. The other year was 2016. And the EU Parliament has declared a climate emergency just last year. And they're also proposing new um, climate law um, to set in uh, law net zero carbon targets by 2050. And of course, the UK is still very much influenced by this because at one point they were actually leading uh, this debate and influencing what was actually happening in Europe as well. Now, for those of you that don't know, Finland actually has the most ambitious carbon neutral society target. They are aiming to do this by 2035. And of course, there's a lot of discussion how we'll get there. And now 2035 still seems some way off, but it's actually only just uh, 14 years a time. It's very soon and um, it's still several years after the UN deadline as well. And so we clearly need to act now, not just in Finland, but throughout all of our societies, because now we can still shape the future. And you can see this graph, it is a courtesy of Andy McIntosh, uh, a feeling like Bradley. 
that uh, we have these different trajectories and on the uh, y-axis you can see basically the uh, temperature degree rises. And at this moment in time, uh, we can still basically determine whether we will stay below this two to one and a half degrees Celsius rise. And we only have these five or 10 years to determine that because we do not want to get to this very high uh, global warming level of five degrees C Celsius or more. So briefly, I do think it's important to reiterate, and it's sort of a little bit discussed earlier as well, that the climate crisis isn't just about CO2. There's also many other societal and environmental challenges as well, and they're very interconnected actually with the climate crisis and carbon emissions. For example, air pollution, which affects health and well-being, which is also related, of course, to then fossil fuel usage and our energy uh, production. We've got, we're also facing a biodiversity decline, an increased aging population, and we're not always aging in good health. And we're also facing increasing population diversity in our cities. So we've got this internal and external migration, growth versus degrowth areas. And it means that we really need to start thinking much more carefully and more genuinely about designing for diversity. And it really also comes back to these climate justice issues that uh, um, Sumita was talking about. Also, Sumita was touching on resources that are finite. And of course, uh, Judith was touching on aging infrastructures and the fact that we really need to urgently upgrade the existing infrastructures we have, yet most policies actually focus on new buildings and they only make up a very small proportion. And then of course, climate change is leading to a change in climate and we still keep designing and building as if that's not the case. And finally, we're also facing affordability and equity issues because there's still uneven access to services, often exacerbated by the changing climate. So there's absolutely no doubt that we need a radical rethink in architecture and construction and how we live. And what is at least encouraging and optimistic is that radical changes are starting to happen. And I want to run through some of these uh, issues and 10 key actions related to that. So first of all, we need to all rethink urban development and we're talking about the 15 minute city. So whereby basically within just 15 minutes, we can cycle or walk to um, away from our home to all of the facilities that we need, including also connections to our work. And so now we're actually, because of the pandemic, talking not just in theory anymore, but really uh, new ways of living that might come true for real. Secondly, we need to really include people, community um, and other stakeholders in design processes. Non-conform architects in Austria have developed this idea and Werkstatt, if you're interested in this, is super interesting to look at. And it's really about on the ground action and working with other experts, including the community as local experts as well in living labs, which is sort of the real context we operate in. Thirdly, we also need to tackle the twin challenges of climate change. This is about mitigation and adaptation. Um, this is Hawkins Brown, uh, Architects Agar Grove in London, and you can see vegetation and also solar shading and balconies that are acting to reduce any overheating. We also need to design low energy housing at scale. Um, so it's no longer good enough that we have these small number of, of uh, uh, projects. Um, and this is again the same project by Hawkins Brown in Agar Grove, which has got uh, 500 passive house standard homes, also some building blocks that are refurbished to a near passive house standard. And so this need for low energy buildings just simply doesn't go away. Anna Sumita was also emphasizing, we of course need to really um, tackle embodied carbon also because it's increasingly important and proportionally um, becomes a greater uh, kind of emphasis. Um, but we really need to understand also how buildings work. So to achieve performance in reality, as Judith was uh, referring to what our book very much covers. And then we need to really think about holistic sustainable architecture. So it's not prioritizing one sustainability aspect at the expense of another. Often as architects, we might mostly focus on the light and aesthetics, or for example, on people and community. And we might actually not really consider much about, for example, um, environmental issues or urban infrastructure. And so what we often then see is that we might, as, as you can see here, I don't know if you can see me move uh, the mouse, but when you can see here these uh, enlarged bubbles, um, we might have this increased focus on the light or energy or materials, but that shouldn't be at the expense of them, for example, the performance or health and well-being. So we can prioritize some aspects, but not when we reduce standards elsewhere. And that's because, of course, we need consistently high values in all individual aspects of sustainable design, giving equal access to high quality architecture for all. 
And if we don't do this, there's some severe unintended consequences when we don't think of it in holistic ways. This is Juarez, which is um, about a 20 minute walk from where I live in uh, Tampere, which is a second city in uh, Finland. Um, and they're building these low energy homes. Most of them are actually in timber construction, local uh, timber forestry products. But we actually explode uh, granite, ancient rocks that is millions of years old that we can never get back. And we cut the forest down, as you can see here in the background and in the foreground. So clearly this might be low energy architecture, but it's not holistic, sustainable architecture. And that also then brings me to checking how things work. Um, and it's realizing that carbon reductions are not just achieved on paper only. So we need to go back and check our designs and fix things and how they actually work in reality. There's actually incredibly little data in Finland and in the Nordic region. As Judith says, there's a huge body of knowledge uh, that's coming out of the UK. Um, in the UK, in uh, the Architects Council, when they did the survey, there was about 19% uh, of British architects that had been involved in some level of post-occupancy evaluation or building performance evaluation is actually only 7% in Finland, for example. So we need more architects and design teams that go and collect feedback on each project so we can fix things, learn and improve our next projects. And this is in EcoViki uh, in Helsinki suburbs, where they went to check uh, about 20 years, uh, more like 60 years actually, after it was built. And you can see in the gray box the requirement level, but that on average the actual energy consumption was greater and some was actually a lot, lot higher as well. But meanwhile, none of these issues were ever fixed. And of course, it's not just about energy and carbon, but also about user satisfaction and well-being parameters. And as you probably gathered, a lot of these things we cover in our book. We also need to, of course, find out if things work before our designs fail. As an example, this is Paradise Park, a publicly funded nursery in London, a picture of when it was newly built. This is a few years after construction when I visited it, so this green wall had completely failed. And since then, this is a Google Grab image actually, um, they've actually decided to grow uh, greenery from the ground up. Um, and so of course, we want to catch these things before they actually fully fail. Another example that's it was even worse is an eco school that got partially demolished because of its failure as well. And that brings me to the seventh point that we shouldn't be looking at failing architecture, but super architecture that works for everyone over time. And it's realizing that being a bit better than business as usual is not sustainable, but we need to go beyond this. And often we hear us as ourselves as architects say, oh, we need like 10 or 20 percent better than building regulations. But we shouldn't forget that building regulations are ultimately the legally worst standard we can get away with. This is not exemplary. And it also means that a lot of our green buildings still have this negative environmental and social impacts as well. So when we talk about holistic, sustainable architecture, that's where we might be neutralizing these impacts and we've truly minimized them. But actually what we should be doing is restorative design, where we create uh, projects with positive environmental and social impacts. And that's why I call this super architecture. And if you're interested, this is actually based on the principles of the living building challenge. Some examples of this, for example, Helen Hard in Norway, in Molabakas, low impact co-housing model, is built in CLT and timber clad, as you can see here, it's actually in an industrial area in uh, Stavanger. Um, and uh, they developed it with the community as well. You can see here some of the shared spaces as well. And so far it's a hugely successful project. And actually some of the architects live in the community as well. Another example is in Denmark by Van Kunsten Architects, Lisburg Hill, and it's a project that's based on adaptability and really focuses on medium and long term uh, ways of adapting. And it's in CLT and post beam hybrid construction. It's also designed for disassembly and gives this future spatial flexibility. So here you can see a slight increase in the embodied energy of the construction, but it can actually be dismantled at the end. And they also decide to do this hybrid construction of post beam and CLT rather than CLT throughout because um, then, or, well, they have these info panels that are in CLT, which then can be removed uh, rather than uh, having them act also as structural material. This is an internal picture of it. And the third case studies are by Arkita, which you're probably familiar with. The Enterprise Center is timber frames, a lime render, innovative touch cladding, as you can see here. It's certified passive house, also BREEAM outstanding. Future climate change modeling was undertaken, uh, has won several awards, and also they collect feedback on project to see how it works in reality. And I think this shows you as well that uh, super architecture means also delightful spaces and material qualities as well.
So, and I hope that's also clear for many of these other projects, which there is no time to go into, but I hope that these projects show that there's no creative constraints. And I would like to quote Marco Hedman, Director General of RTS, the Building Information Centre in Helsinki, who said, I can't imagine something being beautiful at this point in the history if it is destroying our environment. And I think that suggests that perhaps we need to actually also rethink what beautiful architecture is or what sustainable architecture looks like. And so we need more of this kind of thinking and these kind of projects and moving towards the super architecture. And a plea that I have, architects are organising, I think we should all join them. You can uh, get in touch with Architects Declare and Architects Climate Action Network. We're now establishing several of these in different countries. Architects are also creating tools, so use them, and especially on materials, we've been very active. So for example, Hawkins Brown here on the bottom left corner, they've got a free Revit plugin for embodied carbon use. Also Field and Craig uh, Bradley here on the bottom right picture, they've got FCBS Carbon, and also Archetype developed uh, some software as well. And Van Kunsten with other uh, partners in Denmark, they developed this material pyramid where you can basically just look at the actual uh, kind of materials and which are some of the better uh, materials to choose in terms of carbon as well. And my final point then is, is that architecture should evolve with changing needs in the world and that we need to practice but also teach differently. We've got this project uh, with uh, all these partners here, um, so in Estonia, in Dublin, in Bologna and in Denmark. It's funded by the EU and Erasmus Plus project and we're developing this digital climate change curriculum for architectural education and methods towards carbon neutrality. So the project's called Arc for Change. We're developing this actual curriculum, but also teacher training toolkit and all of that as a free resource on a digital platform. And uh, while it's actually for education, uh, I think it'd also be very useful for practices. So please do get in touch if you're interested, add it to test or contribute it as well. So to wrap up, ask yourself three key questions for making a building. This is by Lars-Erik Matila, Finnish architect. Is it really necessary? Is it sustainable? And can it be repeated indefinitely? And only then should we be actually making moves in creating super architecture. So I hope that we can all work together for a more sustainable world. That was it from me for today, at least. Thank you, Sophie. That was incredibly informative. Um, and I know you've rattled through an awful lot of information in a very short period of time, so thank you. Um, I suppose on that note, it's worth reminding people that the presentations will be on uh, architecture.com after the event as well. So to start off with the questions, uh, I've got a question for Samita, but it'd be interesting to hear uh, our other panelists view as well. Um, I mean, we've got over 500 people on the call today. So what can individual architects do to make a difference? Um, I think as a building industry, as I said, you know, we have a huge responsibility. We are responsible for so much of the carbon emissions. We can do something, particularly in the Western world. So I feel there's a moral responsibility on each practice, whatever the size is to you know, do something and I think Sophie's last uh, slide you know is it really necessary you know is it being built sustainably and also can it be repeated I think what you mean is sort of a module a repeatable construction uh, that's what I understood from your slide you know ask yourself those basic questions and think about retrofit you know I think both Judith and Sophie made that point very powerfully that we already have so much of building already you know how can we actually reuse that building how can we actually make it more energy efficient and uh, make it more people friendly Sophie or Judith, do you want to add to that? I do quickly. Uh, you go oh. both at the same time. No, I absolutely second that. I think that's a really good summing up. I think if you only did one thing and you weren't sure where to start, then I would start getting engaged with the activities that are happening at the RIBA, uh, especially, of course, if you're a member as well, um, but also, of course, Architects Climate Action Network. And I think there's there's a huge energy and momentum there. And I think it's fantastic to be part of that. Um, and that's if you can only do one thing, then that's what I would do as a starting point. And I think everything else will fall into place from there. And if I can add, if revisit the buildings that you have completed and, and gather the lessons learned, document them and 
and make sure you document the value that you have created. And if you can, get hold of some performance data as well so you can present to your clients the benefit of doing things well. There's nothing like having the evidence on the day, on the table, when you are in a tricky discussion with a client and the contractor. The one thing I learned from all these years of doing feedback is instead of doing in-house training, all we, in the end all we did was take architects and visit the buildings that they built and, and, and yes, document the lessons learned. So I suppose on that note, Judith, we had a question come in saying that aren't insurers discouraging post occupancy evaluations? My favourite question. <laughs> we have actually answered this question in the book, but <laughs> for your benefit today. Um, the, so this, is, this is very much an ongoing discussion. Insurers used to discourage um, doing post occupancy evaluations. And we have one of the discussions that we have had is actually doing these evaluations may, risk, may seem risky in the short term, but in, in the long term, the architects who do most of the evaluations are likely to have the least defects and if you can detect defects, if you, even if defects do show up, if you can catch them during the defects liability period, they're much more likely to be fixed early on where you still have the design team on board, you still have the documentation about the building, uh, nobody has uh, sort of decanted, so you still have the people who were involved in the project and are able to fix things much more quickly. The RBA's insurers are actually supporting post-occupancy evaluation. They do recommend that you do it under a separate contract for various reasons. Um, and there are ongoing discussions with other insurers to, to, to make this more smooth because it does matter a lot. Yeah, thank you for the excellent question. Thanks, Julia. Um, I suppose this one's for Sophie. Uh, I think you're probably best placed and it's come from uh, Maya and it says, do you think universities and educators are doing enough to teach future architects about this matter? At the moment, no, but uh, I, I can expand that answer. No, I, I think that um, I think that there is the will, definitely. And I think what's fantastic is that also now students are actually demanding that change, which then actually helps for teachers to ask for more resources and to get those resources. Um, because I do think that it's been far too few of us who've had the skills to teach it for far too many students and not enough resources. Um, and I do think that this is shifting quite fast. Um, I also know that the RBA is doing a lot of these things, uh, you know, to shift that and um, the, uh, yeah, and, and also, of course, projects that we're doing like this with these free resources. But in a way, it should have happened already yesterday and a decade ago. Um, so we're not doing enough. And each year that we don't actually teach climate literacy is a lost year, a lost generation. So um, um, we're working very hard, day and night, pretty much. Yeah. I don't know whether Samita or Judith want to add to that. Uh, both of you are academics and educators or no, no. <laughs> Um, and we'll take one final question. I said if we haven't been able to get through all the questions today, um, so we will respond to any uh, after the event. Uh, it's come from Ralph Carpenter, who's the, on the RBA Sustainable Futures Group uh, on the Letty Retrofit project, uh, Modess Architects based in Suffolk. And it says no one is talking about nature first, which demands a radical rethink of our place in the world and which places a much greater emphasis on a gentle relationship between architects and the planet. If Nature First was placed centre stage, would it help us to develop a more subtle relationship between our buildings and the surroundings, helping us to source our materials using a circular economy approach and ensuring that they truly sit uh, lightly on the earth? I'm getting nods from our panellists, so I don't know who wants to answer it. So. I'm just very glad that you raised this point because it, it is so important and, and it's one of the areas where architects have so much opportunity to reimagine the way in which we 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 occupy the planet and, and, and how we live in it, how we interface with it. Um, and um, it's the, the, the notion of regenerative architecture really captures, um, I think, what you're talking about very well. But maybe others would want to add. I think the, the slide, one of the slides that showed the fact that, you know, we are uh, under the control of nature and nature is not always fair or is it benevolent. So we are in a way very powerless. We have to work with nature. And I make that very clear. So nature first, obviously. 
And maybe if I, I know time's up, but I actually think it's even a bigger question than about nature. I think we have to completely rethink what we do as architects and perhaps some of what we do might not even be building at all. Um, and I think we first need a systemic change and in how we think of what our job, our role is and what we contribute. And then I think nature, the other, uh, also biodiversity, other species become very much part of that. So there's a slight strange um, maybe contradiction in that I think at the same time we have to become much more user centric so that we design with users, stakeholders, community in mind. And I think Sunita also covered that. But also at the same time, we need to actually become less human centric. So, um, you know, that we it's not just that we're designing for ourselves as architects, but we also think of the other species and uh, in the environment. Thank you to all our panellists, very good answers. So that's unfortunately all we've got time for uh, this evening. Uh, we've run quite a tight ship and make sure you all get home early. So um, I'd like to say thank you to our, all of our guest speakers, uh, Samita, Judith and Sophie for your time, um, not just today in preparing your presentation, but also your time in all the tech rehearsals and all the show business that goes on behind the scenes. So thank you very much. Um, also I'd like to thank our sponsors, Ibstock, um, who without their support wouldn't be able to hold events like today and the Local Initiative Fund, uh, which is an RBA Nations and Regions Committee uh, involvement. Um, I'd like to thank RBA Publishing, um, who have very kindly given us £5 off book, uh, £5 off voucher for two books, uh, which you'll receive notification of after this email. Um, and there will be five lucky winners that get uh, Sophie, uh, Judith and Hattie's new book uh, following this event as well. Uh, and then finally, it's just to promote some upcoming events. Uh, the RBA is a region we continue our People Place Planet with Alison Brooks Architects, who will be discussing health and well-being in architecture on the 9th of March. Um, but as all of our guest speakers said, it's about collaboration. So I'm actually going to propose that people go to the Architects Climate Action Network's event, uh, which they've been holding an excellent circular uh, economy series and their next lunchtime session is on the 25th of February, which will be on stage three spatial coordination. I'd also recommend if you've got time to have a look at their embodied carbon campaign um, as well. So thank you once again to all of our panellists. Uh, thank you all for joining us and hope you have a good evening. <laughs>